This video is part two of a two-part series where I answer frequently asked questions about dust crete, which is a technique I use to put an addition onto my cordwood cottage here on the farm. Uh, there's a link up here in the corner for you to see that first part of this series, and we'll get into it and answer a lot more of your questions. Flammability. Now, you can easily find uh, tests on hempcrete regarding flammability where they'll put a torch on a hempcrete wall for several minutes and it will not catch flame. You'll just have a little dark spot where the torch was. And I haven't tried that with the dust creep, but we'll do a test also coming up that will demonstrate whether or not it passes that test. I certainly suspect it will. It's more about oxygen and you know fire requires three things fuel oxygen and heat and if you provide the heat there is some fuel in there with the sawdust but if oxygen is not getting to it then it's not going to just take off and burn is my prediction at any rate the other thing about the system unlike say a fiberglass bat uh, conventionally framed building there is no void within the wall so no matter how nice that fiberglass bat is stuffed into that void there's going to be air gaps on either side which allow a pathway for fire to travel and because these walls are pack formed into place those air gaps don't exist so you know even if it were to catch and smolder a little bit that fire isn't going to run like it would in some more conventional uh, types of, of construction A lot of people are also interested if this material is bulletproof and it's a reasonable question to ask uh, when we think about a conventional wall with the siding and sheathing and insulation and drywall it is certainly not bulletproof anything of a higher caliber will absolutely go through that wall no problem with this product it is dense but has air in it and so the ballistic performance against a projectile could very well be that it will absorb the kinetic force of that bullet in all of the little micro air pockets within it and actually slow down you know uh, anything that was fired at it so what we'll do is we'll put together a test where i mock up a, a sample wall and then test it on a variety of calibers and, and different types of uh, munitions from a 22 up to a 30 out six and just see if uh, it will stop a bullet at a given thickness. So subscribe if you want to see that. A lot of people want to know what different types of sawdust would be appropriate for making dust creep. I recommend that you, if you can, find a chunky sawdust similar to what I'm using. This sawdust comes off of a circular sawmill. They've got a eight or six foot blade and a quarter inch kerf, and so it throws big chunks of wood. And that's just what they use down at my local sawmill. And as I mentioned in that other video, I can pick up an entire truckload of that for $20, which gives me a lot of volume for a little bit of money. Now, if you were running a chainsaw quite a bit and collecting the sawdust that comes off of a well-sharpened saw chain, that also perfectly appropriate. You can also buy in plastic bales animal bedding, but like they usually call it fine. And that material is identical to the sawdust that I'm using. So if you had to buy it in, go to a, you know, a feed store or tractor supply or someone like that and pick up those, those bales of uh, fine shavings. And that'll work great for this. There have been questions about whether or not wood chips will work. Now at my last farm, I did do a little mock-up about uh, one by one by four feet of a wood mulch just right out of a chipper and just straight lime and just basically made a little curb and that seemed to work it seemed to last pretty pretty well 
it of course was um, a lot chunkier and would eat up a lot more plaster, but it may also, you know, hold a lot more air within the wall. So that also could very much be a viable way to go. I would probably want to screen that down through like a, you know, one and a half by two roll wire fence, something like that, just to get any large sticks and things like that out of the mulch so that uh, you wouldn't end up trying to pack it into tight areas in the wall voids and have some stick obscuring your ability to completely fill areas like that. So a lightly screened mulch or wood chip could work just fine. We'll do some tests on that as well. One of my big questions that uh, rarely gets asked, but something I think about a lot, is the use of this material in a roofing system because that ends up being the uh, linchpin on a lot of natural builds where, okay, you're gonna go through all this to create a non-toxic home with natural materials, and then when it comes to the roof, they spray foam. Or in my case, I used fiberglass insulation bats. Now, at uh, five and a half inch depth, or two by six framing like I have in my roof, that gets you R19 if you're using insulation, uh, fiberglass insulation. It is the most affordable option, but you know, it doesn't matter what the R value of the walls ends up being if the roof is under insulated. And I would say in my circumstance, the roof is under insulated. I would prefer to have an R50, but that's, you know, a lot of thickness, a lot of material. And so I think about how well this material would perform in a roof application, how best to go about it. So I thought about block systems and things like that where I could form blocks of the material and insert it into the voids in, in a roof structure. I think that it probably actually would work out better to just go ahead and pour in place. And I mean, even if you had a fairly uh, steep slope, you could load this material in and tap it down as long as you had a good backing on the underside, the inside ceiling portion of the roof system. So what I would probably do would be to form it on the back side with OSB with the intention of removing it and then fill it all and then pull that OSB and put whatever finish on that I wanted in the end, either tongue and groove wood, or you could even, you know, uh, put drywall up or just plaster it. I would probably not go with drywall, and if I did, I would want it to be a green board or something that was mildew resistant, or, you know, intended for a wet area, just for any condensation that might happen with the sun shining on that roof. You get a lot of temperature variation, and moisture is going to want to move through it. So probably best to stick with the you know, breathable uh, wall finish regardless of what that is and ultimately plaster would probably be the choice there as well. There have also been a lot of questions about whether or not a block or panel system is possible with this material. So this wall behind me here is about five feet by eight feet high with a thickness of about seven inches. In that there is a bag of Portland cement and a bag of lime. So your weight for that size of a panel would be the 98 pounds of the Portland cement plus the 50 pounds of the lime plus the weight of the sawdust, which is nominal. So I would say that this wall section weighs less than 200 pounds in other words, a two-foot um, uh, section of wall that was six inches thick and eight feet high would be under 100 pounds, probably like 80 pounds, and could be handled and maneuvered by one person. Um, so that answers any questions that there are about weight, which I've also, you know, heard from quite a few people. So basically, you know, five by eight by six and a half seven inches thick weighs less than 200 pounds so any conventional framing decking system should bear the load without a problem 
So yes, one could make panels and theoretically one could even form them so that they were tongue and groove and slip them together like uh, SIPS panels. So that's something to try. I don't know if it would be wise to have some sort of reinforcement in that, like a wire, you know, concrete mesh, something like that. I tend to steer away from any reinforcement whenever possible, just because if you're relying on that reinforcement for structural integrity, as soon as you pour it, the clock is ticking. You have 100 years before that iron inside of there dissolves into nothing. So if you're relying on it, and we've got you know an issue with infrastructure around the country that's 100 years old and is now crumbling, and if you look at you know bridges in, in major cities that are 100 years old, you can see that there's big chunks falling off of them and they're in bad shape. So if possible, I like to design systems that do not require that. So yeah, that's the question. At, uh, at what thickness? Is it manageable? How would you set up a panelized system? And I may also do some experiments with that. Um, you absolutely could if your panel was movable and wouldn't split in half on you. Screw it right to the outside of a timber frame like you would with a SIP and then plaster it and, and away you go. Some people are wondering how this would fit into the International Residential Construction Code. Now, recently, hempcrete has been included in the IRCC as a viable building material. And so it is, you know, not substantially different in any way from hempcrete in terms of how you build with it. Um, the question would be if it would pass the R value requirements of uh, the construction code. And we'll get to that in just a moment. If you're building a timber, timber frame structure, as long as you meet certain requirements in terms of uh, thermal efficiency and uh, you know non-drafty structures, as long as the frame is bearing the load of the roof, there are quite a few things that you can put between the timbers. And that is often accepted by local building departments. Conditions may vary, check local listings. Um, could it just be done with a conventional frame? Well, certainly. If you just went with a two by four wall, as used to be the standard, and then offset your forms on either side, you could produce you know, a two foot thick wall if you wanted to, as long as the load was being borne by uh, a suitable stick frame structure. Then the exciting thought is, okay, well, could you use this material and not use any wood framing members at all? And there's a possibility that you could. If I was going to try it, I would just use concrete forms, as one would if pouring a stem wall, and pack those with the dust creek. And then once it was cured and the forms were off, I would form up and do a reinforced bond beam on the top and let that carry the load and distribute that load evenly across the dust creek wall. Of course, the most asked question about dust creek is what is the R value? And I don't know. This is where you guys can actually help me. I'm designing tests to approximate at least what the R value is. The thought that I have is if I get a two inch rigid foam with a known R value and basically make a cooler out of it and then pour dustcrete at the same thickness, make a identically sized cooler out of that and place frozen water bottles in both, put them in the same conditions and track how long it takes the water to melt in both of the samples. So I should be able to approximate based on the known R value of the rigid foam, what the R value of the dustcrete is. Now the range for R value in hempcrete is between 2.6 and 3.8 R per inch. And I'm going to assume that it's going to fall somewhere in that range. It may not be quite as insulative as hempcrete is, 
but I think around R3 is the uh, predictable answer that we're looking for. And so that means that in these walls here, if we round down the thickness of, the, of this wall to six inches, then R18 is what this wall is performing at, if that's an accurate number. But if anybody has any ideas of more accurate ways of testing R value, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts for sure. So drop them in the comments down below. The other consideration with this as a building material in terms of overall thermal efficiency is that R value is not the only factor in determining how uh, much you will need to input energy wise to heat or cool a home. The other consideration is thermal mass. So once again, if this wall weighs 200 pounds, then it's more massive than a conventionally framed wall with fiberglass bat insulation on the inside. So that means that it has more heat storage capacity and it is a combination of thermal mass and insulation that gets you thermal efficiency. The IRCC for many years has really skewed toward just considering R value, although that's kind of changing as more of these systems get adopted. But the question is how much input does it require to heat and cool the building? Now this building is entirely heated with wood uh, from the land here. As you can see, I've got lots of wood. So I heat with just a wood stove. We will be putting a rocket mass heater in this room in the springtime. So also stay tuned for that that will greatly reduce the amount of wood that I need to burn. And in fact, I could probably heat this house just with what falls out of these old trees when the wind blows, if I had that rocket mass heater. So with respect to the international building code, they're attempting to curtail the amount of fossil fuel energy required to heat the home. In this case, it's already zero because I'm heating with annualized uh, thermal budget material because it's all, you know, from these trees rather than mined out of the ground. So it doesn't really matter to me. And where I live, there are no building codes, so it doesn't matter to anybody else either. If you are in a situation where you're constrained by the code, then, you know, having this information uh, without sending it to UL Labs or somebody to actually test it for our value, uh, it'd be good to have a, a number you could use. And, you know, if anybody has any ideas, as I say, about how to design a more accurate test than what I'm thinking about, please share them and we'll do the best ones uh, when it comes time for that. Other questions have uh, involved cost. Now this is going to vary widely depending on your region as we've learned from the question of uh, where to find and how much you must pay for type S lime. But when I built this wall, I was paying uh, $8 for a sack of lime and $10 for a sack of Portland. And so, you know, the framing members and electrical uh, considerations notwithstanding, the cost of the dust grid itself was in the neighborhood of about $20 for this entire wall. So it's 40 square feet and there's $20 of material in it approximately, so 50 cents a square foot at, uh, you know, nominally six, seven inches thick. So extremely affordable. Some other people have asked about workshops and there may be some opportunities upcoming. I've got a neighbor who wants to put in a fairly extensive privacy wall using this system. And I'll be doing a couple of projects around the farm as well. So one or multiple of those uh, circumstances may be right for putting together a workshop. And if that is going to happen, I'll do a video announcing that here. Also, you can follow me um, at Radical Gastronomy on Instagram, and I'll post about those opportunities there as well. You can also go to RadicalGastronomy.com and fill out the uh, email uh, query there and get on a mailing list for a newsletter I'll put out at the time. And um, those are the best ways to stay in touch 
and find out if that's going to happen. So if that's something you're interested in, comment that as well, and we can speak more about that directly. Also, um, my daughter-in-law has taken on the role of producing all of the Radical Gastronomy merchandise and has populated the merch store over at RadicalGastronomy.com with a bunch of new good uh, provocative t-shirts and mugs and totes and things like that. So go check that out. I'll put a link in the description so you can uh, shop around over there if you like. It sure helps out the channel and also my uh, son and daughter-in-law and their young family over there in Texas. So uh, I encourage you to take a look at that. So stay tuned to the channel and there will be lots of fun Descrete stuff coming up along with some other projects. We're looking at uh, putting in a root cellar and that rocket mass cedar and maybe a timber frame and tempered glass greenhouse. We'll see what we have time for in the season upcoming, but lots of good stuff coming down the pike and I sure appreciate all you guys for watching.